Order. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to um, ask that uh, everyone please silence your cell phones. Um, Representative Collins, would you be willing to have our prayer this morning? Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and for this beautiful day and to be here and um, do the work for the people. I just pray that you um, be with those that are presenting and help us um, share, help them to share with us what um, good things that they're doing for the students in Alabama. And we thank you for um, all your blessings. So we ask your blessings on this meeting and this day. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Again, please silence your cell phones. Clerk will call the roll. Here. Thank you. We have three presentations this morning. The first up would be uh, Nia Scott with the Retirement Assistance of Alabama. Good morning, everybody. So as uh, Mr. Chairman introduced me, I'm Nia Scott. For those of you that are new to the committee, um, I am legislative counsel for the Retirement Systems of Alabama, and I've been doing this. This will be my 10th session. Um, and so I am here for y'all. I'm here to be a resource. Retirement and health care are not simple issues. It's very complicated, but it's very important. And so anything y'all need, call me. We can get you whatever information resources you need. And with me is Jo Moore. She's our deputy director. And so you'll see her, her over here every now and then. Um, and between the two of us, hopefully we can get get you the information and, and help y'all in what y'all are trying to accomplish. So I, there's a lot of things that I could tell you about today. I could talk to you about pensions and health care for an hour, two hours, but nobody wants to hear that for that long and nobody could stay awake through that for that long. And so I'm going to try and hit high points and I've got some additional information in the presentation that you can go back through. I've got even more slides, more information if you've got something you want me to focus on later or get to you. Um, but I'm just going to give you general information. Those who have been on the committee for a while, this won't be new, but hopefully I can get you something that you haven't heard before. So I'm going to talk about the broad context of RSA and kind of give you that overview. And then I'm going to focus on TRS and PHIP because that's what comes before you, but it kind of is helpful to understand the, the bigger picture as well. And so I'm going to talk about benefits, about funding, talk about investments, and then I'm going to talk about PHIP for a little bit, and hopefully in under 20 minutes. So, so RSA administers the pensions for the education employees, and that's the teacher's retirement system, for state employees, which is the employee's retirement system, for the judicial branch, which is the judicial retirement fund, and then also for local units, as we call them, cities, counties, other local boards, and they are under ERS, but they are all their own retirement systems. So they are solely responsible for funding um, and for that system itself. The state does not pay for any of the locals. And then we also administer what we call PHIP, and we also use a lot of acronyms. So, but PHIP is the Public Education Employees Health Insurance Plan, and it provides health insurance to all active and retired education employees and their dependents. Another thing that's under the RSA umbrella is RSA 1. It's a deferred compensation plan that is managed um, by RSA and invested through the RSA investment staff, and all public employees are eligible to participate, including legislators. And it's a, it's a great program. There's no investment fees. So by law, we do it. Your money stays your money. We don't deduct anything. And so if you haven't signed up for RSA 1, sign up for RSA 1. It's great. So this is just a kind of breakdown of the plans. And, um, you know, one thing in talking about RSA is what... What governs RSA? We, we don't just do whatever we feel like. Um, we have 
the Alabama constitutional provision that governs the, the money that we hold in trust. It can only be used for members' benefits. We have our statutes that y'all set that set the benefit levels and the administration of the plan and the, the board structure. Then we have our boards. So we have two boards, the Teachers Retirement System Board that governs TRS and the Employees Retirement System Board that governs ERS and JRF. And then the TRS board also serves as the PHIP board. Then we have various federal laws. We have to comply with a lot of IRS requirements to keep our tax exempt status. The, a lot of the SEC stuff comes into play with our investments. And then you get into professional standards, actuarial, accounting. There's, there's, there's a lot involved in this. So this is a breakout of the employers in the system. And so a lot of times when we come before the committee and we talk about TRS, we're really focused on K-12 um, because that is the biggest part of TRS. But you've also got community colleges, you've got universities, and you've got some other state agencies. So it's, it's more than just K-12. This is a breakout just kind of to give you a snapshot of how many active members are in each system, how many retirees, what's the active payroll, which is what the employer contribution is paid on, what's the retiree payroll, which as you can see, it's, it's a big number, 2.4 billion in retirement benefits for TRS retirees. And this is, and members of the committee that have been on here for a while are familiar with this. This is kind of my cheat sheet for the benefit levels and you break it down by the tiers and then by classification. And so if you have a question about how a benefit is set or what, you know, what's the difference between tier one and tier two, this is, this is your document. And as a lot of y'all may know, tier two was created in 2012, um, part of kind of some of the pension reforms to reduce the, the cost of benefits and it, it cut the benefit down from the tier one levels. And there've, there've been some adjustments over the past few years to recognize some issues with the tier two, um, such as the sick leave conversion. So that was one thing that, you know, you, you, it's hard to contemplate what the impact is gonna be from changes, but when you, in tier two, teachers couldn't convert sick leave to retirement credit, but they also can't get paid for it. And so kind of the impact was, then what's the incentive to not take it? And so the legislature added the sick leave conversion back in, and hopefully that's kind of helped with that issue. And last session added in 30 year retirement um, with an early retirement penalty. And then the, the local units can now go back because of an act from the legislature can provide tier one benefits for their tier two members, um, but they're solely responsible to pay for that. Um, Okay, so briefly to talk about funding, how are we funded? Three main sources from the member's contribution, the employer's contribution, and then investment earnings. And when you talk about funded, how we're funded, you gotta talk about the unfunded liability. I'll hear that a lot, it's a big number, but what does it mean? So the unfunded liability is a calculation by the actuaries as to what is the present value for all of the benefits that are currently owed, not just to retirees, but to the people that are actively working. And then compare that with what's the actuarial value of our assets. And that's where you get your unfunded liability number. And then that percentage is the funded ratio. And so we talk a lot about the funded ratio and where we're at with that. And this is kind of a snapshot of what that funded ratio has looked like for TRS and ERS since 2000. And as you can see in 2000, we were fully funded at 100%. And there's been a number of events that happened between 2000 and 2009 that kind of impacted the drop in the funded ratio. And one thing I wanna point out is it doesn't look like it's gone up very much. And I, you know, some of y'all have heard me say this a lot. We're like a ship. It takes a long time to turn. And so kind of coming back from that is a long process. But in the meantime, there have actually been a lot of things that the board has done that has kept that number a little bit lower. And this is kind of counterintuitive. And Chairman Garrett and I have talked about that a lot because there's a lot of things about pensions that are counterintuitive. 
but there's been really good conservative changes that have been made, lowering the investment return, closing the amortization schedule. But those are things that actually keep the funded ratio down because it increases your liability. When you lower how much money you're assuming RSA is going to make in the future, that increases your liabilities. It increases the, the amount, the normal cost that the employer pays because if we're going to make less, the employers are going to kick in a little bit more now. And so we, we would love to drop the assumed rate of return to 5% because that's an easy target. But the employers couldn't afford to pay the cost associated with that. So, um, but I think the most important question when you're looking at a funded ratio, like when we're compared to other states, is what are the assumptions and methods underlying that ratio? Because we could change some things with our funding policy and with the actuaries and could jump the funded ratio up to 80, 90%. But is that good for the system in the long term? No, you've, you've got to have the right assumptions and do the right thing. So when you're looking at what that number is and comparing us to other states, you've got to ask some good baseline questions. Ms. Scott, can I make you just a couple of questions? Please. And correct me if I'm wrong, but just to clear, just as a way of information for some of the new members. She mentioned the counterintuitive portion of this. So for example, uh, uh, lowering what you expect the fund will, re, will, will earn increases the deficit relative to the liability that you're yes. going to have to pay. So that's yes. intuitively, that's a good thing to lower the return. It is. But, but there's, a, there, there's that impact. Also, uh, several years ago, we cut the number of state employees, mm -hmm. which was a good, perceived to be a good streamlining type move. But when you reduce the number of employees, that also added to re reduce the um, income basically coming into the fund. So basically, but increase the liability threshold amount. So that was that. Then the other thing on this chart that's important, I think, is the unfunded COLAs. So you can see prior to 2010, there were a number of unfunded cost of living adjustments, mm -hmm. meaning that the retire retirees just got increases and those were not funded. And that ended up basically adding to this ratio. Your note here says it's about, you estimate about $2 billion of the unfunded amount is related to unfunded COLAs. So those are just things I wanted to mention for the benefit of new members. All great points. Um, let's, I'll give you, I will, I will, I will, yes, yes, Representative Ellis, you're recognized. I'm, I'm the special one. Um, so what, what's the ideal, what's our target for the funded ratio? Ideally 100%. Okay. Um, but in terms of what's healthy, it's really that number is what kind of underlines, underlie, what assumptions are you, is the employer paying the contribution every year, which y'all have, Alabama has never underfunded the system. Y'all have always paid the employer contribution rate. So you want to be 100%, but what's healthy? Um, and are you moving in the right direction is another question. So if I might, I, I, I see uh, former State Finance Director Bill Newton with us today. I'm not sure your judgment on this. 100% may be ideal. I don't think that's really practically ideal. I don't think it's really what you want to be. A lot of the pension systems that are in trouble around the country were like in the 50s or the 40s or whatever. We're like in 70%. Mm -hmm. In my mind, if you're 80% or north, you're healthy. Director Newton, would you agree with that? Okay, good. Thank you. You taught me well. So this is going to kind of move move forward a little quicker through some of these slides, but this is the, the rates that the employees pay. It's part of that, the member contribution of the funding. And these are set in statute. And so, um, and they're, they're submitted to RSA based on the member's salary, kind of every payroll. And once this member money is always member money. So if, if they leave the system, they and they're not vested, they take their money with some interest um, that is protected. It's always theirs. We kind of skip through the employer contribution rate. Um, you know, this is set by the actuaries. It's also a percentage of payroll. And so it's. It's kind of a long timeline to get there. The rate that we're bringing this session to you to be set in the budgets for fiscal year 24 is based on the fiscal year 21 actuarial valuation. And that's just because of the timing of it. So the actuaries get all the information from us at the end of the fiscal year 21, 
takes them some time to put it all together and they get it to us in the summer of 22. And then we submit that to the executive budget office so it can go in all of the employer's budgets. They need to know what that number is so they know what to bring to you. And then we come and talk about it in the 23 session. So there's just, you know, I like to talk about we're a ship and I like to talk about this, this timeline too. So nothing moves really quickly. Um, this is kind of our, our funding sources. We don't know exactly where the money comes from because it comes to us and they don't say this is ETF money, this is you know general fund money, this is a earmark. It, it, we don't know, but the statute sets that the contribution to us is paid from the same source as salaries. And as you know, public employee salaries are paid from a variety of sources. This is just, I, Chairman Garrett's familiar with this because every budget year, this is kind of what I send to the budget chairs for TRS and ERS. And it's just a, a snapshot of here's the requested rate, here's the estimated total dollar, here's what we estimate flows for the ETF and kind of the past two years for comparison. Talk briefly about investments. So that's another big part of the funding. Um, for RSA. And so the, the general kind of investment processes are set in statute, and then the board's going to set policies that governs how the investment staff can execute that. And their policies set asset allocations and some, some different things. One thing their policies do not do and we've never done is ESG investing. Now it's kind of a hot topic right now and um, kind of hearing that in the news, and that's investing for environmental, social, or governance issues reasons. And we don't invest for those reasons. We invest for profitability. Um, and we don't have any outside managers that are making decisions based on that for us because we do everything in house. And so RSA investment staff and the boards are making those decisions for what is going to get the best return. Um, and another kind of side benefit of doing it in house is we save money. We spend about $15 million a year in investment expenses. If we spent what the average amount is for pensions, we'd spend 182. If we were like some states, like South Carolina, I think all of their money is managed externally, they spent $700 million last year. So that impacts what is going into the trust and is gonna go for members' benefits. So 700 versus 15 million, I, I think it's, it's a, no brainer. Um, so I also do this slide fairly often. And this was a lot more fun last year when that first year return was a 22% return. Um, because, uh, you know, no one's really excited about a negative 13% return. Um, but we're a creature of the markets. The markets have been very volatile. Um, and we're going to tell you the good and the bad. And so, you know, in this fiscal year, we're not sure what's going to happen. We're five months in and we're about 8% up, but we've got seven more months to go. And so, um, and you know, the investment staff does the best they can to hedge risk and to, to do what they can to avoid it. But when we're S&P's down, you know, 15%, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to hide anywhere. So just to point out on this chart here, last year, your return was in the negative 13%. If you did a five-year return, you're close to 5%. 10-year mm -hmm. return, you're close to 7%. So that just want to point out that you look at the, the you know, one year would impact the rolling average calculation. It will. And and just so you know, too, you know, the, the returns are very volatile, but we don't we, that's why we smooth them out when we consider the um, employer contribution rate. So we factor in one fifth at a time of the return. Right. So we've we've still got four years of unrecognized, uh, four parts of the unrecognized 20% return, which hopefully helps smooth out this negative 13% return. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you. Can you just get kind of the meat of what you're, what's left and then we'll Yes, we'll... it's just PHIP. Um, these are just some, some different charts I like to put up, but go real quickly through PHIP. Um, you know, PHIP has about 300,000 covered lives for active and retired um, education employees. And as 
everyone is aware healthcare costs are rising. Um, PIP struggles with that, just like everybody else that's providing healthcare. Um, and so how we how y'all fund PHEP is through an employer contribution rate and then through member co-pays, premiums, that sort of thing. And the employer contribution rate is, is similar in some ways to the RSA rate. You set it in the budgets, employers pay it, but instead of a percentage of payroll, it's a dollar amount per active per month. And so you'll hear that $800 per active per month. And that is how the employers fund the um, the health benefit. And that $800 covers not just the active, but their dependents, their retirees and their dependents. Um, and so, and we've been set at this, we're coming for our eighth year of at this same rate. And we're hoping to get to continue doing that. I want you to repeat that, what you just said. The eighth year of level funding. For healthcare costs, <laughs> which is. Without increasing member cost either. So the member premiums have not gone up in that time either. And the members pay, you know, just like you do, a, a certain amount per month. And I, I think the active single is $30, $35 per month. It's kind of a breakdown of how that money is allocated. Um, and this is kind of some of the funding sources and the dollar amounts. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, we've got several presentations, but I've got a couple of questions, and I'm, I'm sure other community members might as well. You mentioned the ESG uh, investing. Is that a policy you have or just a practice? We do not have an ESG policy. So when you hear about ESG investing, it's typically the, the investor has an ESG policy that they invest for those factors and only for those factors. And so our investment policy is to invest for the return. Right. And I think the story is unfolding about some of the bank failure that's gone on in Silicon Valley. But I think that was one factor that's been mentioned is that that strategy has been a contributing factor, but just for whatever's worth. Second, you mentioned the in-house, um, the savings from that doing that in-house. Um, just candidly, I think sometimes over the years there's been a combative relationship sort of between the legislature and RSA. Um, I think that, that, uh, that um, sometimes there's been a lot of things said both ways. Um, but I think one thing that's been positive has been the um, the fact that you do the in-house investing and your returns, when you really look at them, they've been, I think, good returns uh, and, and um, you've done on an efficient basis. So I think that's something that I want to mention. The other thing, two things I want to ask you to address, if you would. Uh, we hear a lot about real estate holdings and uh, particularly um, golf courses. Right. Can you address right. that? Yes. So, you know, our highest profile invest investments are actually probably the smallest part of our portfolio. 10% um, of our portfolio is in real estate. 5% of that is actually 55 Water in New York City, which is the largest office building there. Um, and then 5% of that is Alabama real estate, um, hotels, office buildings, golf course and a few other smaller things, but the golf course is less than a percent of the portfolio. And so, but it's, it's the thing you see right. probably the most. Then I was at a conference recently where someone pointed out and just was reading of a magazine that RSA had, was the number one pension fund holding of equity percentages. Is that a valid statement? And what would you say about the percentage of equity holdings right now as a strategy? And what, what is your thinking on that? So, that, I mean, that's a constant moving target. And I'd have to ask Mark Green, our chief investment officer, about us being the number one. I know we're about 50 percent in domestic equities and probably about 10 percent in international. Um, and, you know, over the past few years, where are you going to put the money? Right. You, you didn't have the option with fixed income to get a return. Now, that seems to be turning around. And as that changes, you know, the boards will address kind of changing that allocation amounts that we can look to in fixed income. So I think these pension plans are the the prototypical long-term view. You're looking over a long-term, you're not reacting to data. Like right now, the market was up wildly yesterday. Now today, it's it started out going way down, you know. You're not panicked by that. You're, you've got a long view with that, and, and that's what you're trying to manage. So. Um, and I will say this about RSA too, and Nia in particular, her staff, and, and Nia in and particular, any question any member has, she will come to your office. She will give you all the detail you want, spend all the time you need to educate you. And uh, I think that's something you should take advantage of if, if you have any questions. Any questions or comments from members? 
uh, Representative Coffin. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, in your opinion, do the golf courses typically generate a positive return for the state? They do. Um, and, you know, it, it varies by some years, depending what's going on. And, and, you know, there's been some natural disasters. You've got to put money back into it um, occasionally. But, yes, over the long term, they do. Any other questions, comments? Well, again, I would urge you to take advantage of, uh, of, of meeting with her and getting in, any information you need. These will be some bills coming through that will be dealing with RSA issues, and you'll need to make sure you understand those. Thank My you. contact information is right there, so anything y'all need, please call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we move to the next presentation, I recognize Representative Baker to introduce some guests. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would ask very quickly, we could do this in just two minutes or less, uh, the USA uh, students and staff, if you'd quickly make your way to the podium, if you'll make your way to the podium at this time. And I would like for the students, if you would, if you would uh, state your name, your hometown, and also your major. Just very proud of that. We, of course, uh, Representative Drummond and I then uh, represent, uh, or I guess on the budget committee here, then represent USA and advocating for them and very proud of them, the students. Also for the staff, Nick, if you would have the staff and they can just identify themselves as well at the tail end, but we'll be very quick. So thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Camille Benora. I'm from Enterprise, Alabama, and I am a hospitality and tourism management major. Uh, my name is Hank Rader. I'm from Wiggins, Mississippi, so it's like right above Biloxi. I'm gonna majoring in accounting. My name is Logan Hawley. I'm from Coleman, Alabama, and I'm a nursing major. Good morning. My name is Josie Albin. I'm originally from Kingman, Kansas, and I'm a marketing and finance double major. Good morning. My name is Mabin Mitchell. I'm from Mobile, Alabama, and I'm a communications major. Good morning. My name is Amaya Douglas. I am currently a junior studying digital cinema and television. Good morning. My name is Heather Sprinkle, and I serve as the Assistant Director for the Student Government Association. Thank you. Thank you for letting them have a minute. To, they're experiencing Montgomery today. This is our student government leadership team, and they're spending the day in the House and the Senate and going over to see the governor a little bit, and they've all written letters to their members of their delegation, so they'll be handing those out today, thanking them for their support of higher education. But thank you for giving them the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Let's, committee, let's welcome these. I just want to say a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit the campus of University of South Alabama with my colleagues, Representative Drummond, Representative Baker, had a wonderful visit, very impressed with what's going on down there, and uh, appreciate all you're doing, and a very impressive group. Uh, let us know how we can help you. And thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, I failed to acknowledge you and in, in coming to Mobile and, and touring the campus and, and, and Mobile, some other educational institutions as well. But thank you so much for, for just your uh, involvement then all across the state. Very much appreciate, appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is, uh, I'm interested to hear this presentation from uh, Ashley Allen, who's the Executive Director for Governmental Affairs for Stride, Inc. Uh, well, maybe a... <laughs> Actually, Mr. Chairman, uh, the head of school is here basically to thank you for legislation that was passed a decade and a half ago that's allowed them to operate two uh, managed schools within Alabama. So Melanie Barkley will be your presenter today. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. Make sure that's there. Yeah, thank you so much for allowing us to present um, to the committee regarding full-time online public school and giving you a glimpse of what that'll look like. I think the best way to start out the presentation is to hear from a, a parent. That is on the spectrum for autism. I went to the brick and mortar school. I had asked them to work with me on doing and testing for IEP. The school told me she did not meet their criteria. So I found Alabama Virtual Academy. She not only graduated with a 4.0, it helped her to be able to get the scholarship to go to University of Mobile, but she graduated as class president. For the last four years, we have been challenged. We have been forced outside of our comfort zone, but we have persisted. We have faced many challenges to get to where we are, but look around, we made it. She was failing. She was literally failing school. I get emotional, y'all, thinking about what Brianna did. She overcame so much. 
and being able to even speak in public. She has overcome so much. Homeschooling them, doing virtual school. At first, it was scary. It was a new season for us, but I'm forever grateful that we did it. It changed everything. I cannot wait to see what you all do in the world. Be phenomenal. Leave here today knowing that every decision you make can impact the lives of others around you. I had a child that is. So what a great story for um, Angela's daughter there at Alva. So what does full-time online public school for Alabama students look like? The Alabama Virtual Academy and the Alabama Destinations Career Academy are accredited, tuition-free, full-time public schools. This is not a remote option and is not a homeschool. We provide a personalized approach with state certified teachers. We offer career prep pathways, honors, advanced placement, dual enrollment, and of course we meet all of the state testing requirements. The ALDCA opened in 2019 with grades K through nine as partners with the Chickasaw Board of Education. This will be the first year they have a graduating class, which is very exciting and are now serving over 1,600 Alabama students. ALVA opened in 2015 and serves 4,000 K-12 students as a partner with the Eufaula City Schools. And you see there, that data was a year ago of a 91% graduation rate. ALVA actually on the report card this year had a 94% graduation rate. And you can see from the data here, our schools are very diverse. So what makes full-time online public school different? First, we have a strong start plan, an orientation plan, where students and families almost have a one-to-one -one experience where they are um, work to develop their schedules and create that individualized plan. The learning management system is, they go over it in depth, and the learning coaches are provided resources and support of where they will be able to have connections throughout the school year. Two, we have box day, as it's called, where all materials, their computers, everything arrives at their home. The students are very excited and they get to receive all their materials. Three, the teachers with the proprietary system have control over the learning management system just to be clear, this is not Zoom, it's not Teams. It's a very secure system and the students have a great way to engage and interact with their teachers. Four, the students have access to all state certified teachers and the STRIDE curriculum, which are aligned, which is aligned to all of the Alabama state standards. The partnership with the school and the learning coach is the integral part and what makes the experience so unique because of the volume of communication and the level of connection that the parents and the learning coaches are able to have. Some other ways that we um, are able to, that looks different, we do provide all the wraparound services such as counseling, we have reading coaches, we have interventionists, we will have a math coach under the Numeracy Act um, in a year or so, we have dyslexia support, so we have all of those systems. All special ed services are provided, special programs, we have speech, we have OT, PT, um, we have, uh, inclusion, transition services, EL, gifted, all of those services are available to all of our students. We have socializing uh, opportunities. That's one of the main questions we get is if you're a virtual school and the kids are all over the state, how do they socialize? We have monthly outings throughout the state of Alabama. We had our prom last week here in Montgomery um, and we had 180 students as juniors and seniors that attended prom on a Thursday night. It was a great experience. We have graduation. Um, our graduation for Alva will be at the uh, multiplex at the Cramden Bowl and Keisha's will be here in Montgomery as well at ALDCA. We have uh, career readiness, which I'll explain a little bit more in detail in the next slide. So becoming career ready, Stride and the state, obviously that is one of our primary focuses. Um, 
Alabama uh, Destinations Career Academy opened with that focus, and they offer various pathways and opportunities to earn credentials and certifications. And you can see there, there are some of the different types of certifications and the pathways. You also see there how we have multiple students, ALDCA has had multiple students in the short time that they've been there that's been able to be employed with industry partners, earn a paid salary. ALVA began pathways this year. We opened up with two pathways and next year we will be adding four more. So we will add pathways in education and training. We will add pathways in computer science, information technology systems and support and business entrepreneurship. And of course, we both have dual enrollment opportunities. And I think one of the highlights there are all the different colleges, including our community colleges that we have signed partnerships with. And for our students that are all over the state, they actually get to experience the local community college where they can go and participate in dual enrollment activities and things like that. I think one of the best ways is to listen to one of our students share his uh, virtual experience. This is Christian from ALDCA. I wake up in the morning at around eight o'clock. I get breakfast, brush my teeth, take a shower, and my classes normally start at nine or 9.30. So I'll normally have about four classes from 9.30 to one o'clock. That's normally my lunch break. And I'll have my last class at maybe two. I work through any homework that I have or any assignments that I have. After about five o'clock, I start working on my dual enrollment courses. Dual enrollment is a program that allows me to take college courses while I'm taking high school courses. So I might actually knock off like a year or a year and a half of my four year college experience. So right now I'm about to attend my algebra two class with Mr. Stevens. My favorite class is kind of tied between math and history. Those are two of my favorite teachers and they bring a lot of energy. Ever since I can remember, I've always loved just telling stories in general. One day my brother came home from school and he had a book report project and one of the options on there was to make a video. So I got my brothers and sisters together and some of my cousins and we put together a film. We submitted that for his project. And so from that moment on, I just really knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker for my career. And I'm also a musician. I'm a visual effects artist. I think film was like the way that I could bring all my talents together. My teachers are very supportive. I've showed them a lot of my work. K-12 has really allowed me much more time to really improve upon my talents, just practice upon my art and get better at it. So when I was in brick and mortar school, I never really focused on like a career. I never really even thought about it. When I went to K-12, they showed us like a lot of opportunities that we could have at our age and a lot of certifications that we can get. It also gave me a career coach and he's been very helpful. He's helped build my resume. It's just an amazing school for preparing you for the future, preparing you for the workforce and just showing you ways that you can start making money. So what does online school look like? Like Christian shared, it's engaging. It covers all required curriculum with, their, with the flexibility for students to explore their passions and gives them the time to prepare for their futures. So you can see here, here's an example of a couple of what our platforms look like. You see at the bottom left, you have uh, the elementary platform. You can see there the teachers there, students are able to manipulate through. There's whiteboards, there's various things, just like you were sitting in a brick and mortar, they're able to experience that as well. You see at the top is the secondary um, platform. You see there our students are coding. They're all in, all in the platform, they're all engaged and they're able to all participate. So are there teachers in live classes? Yes. Students are scheduled in live classes daily and they have the opportunity multiple times throughout the week for online support, as well as collaboration with other students and peers and any services that they need. So is there work outside of live classes? Yes. Um, students work through Stride's world-class curriculum. And like I said, that's all aligned to Alabama state standards, but we offer PE, we offer electives, we have art, music. We have, obviously you've seen the career pathways that we have for secondary and middle school. So we have Spanish, foreign language, all of those things the students all get to experience. 
So what is a learning coach? A learning coach could be the parent predominantly, grandparent, um, a guardian, but that's they, they play a key role in the student's experience and partners with the teacher to create and to um, work through the student's experience throughout the year. Um, they help monitor the attendance. They also have a direct line of communication with this teacher as well as the administration or anyone there at, um, at the school that could support them, counselors, et cetera. So how should we schedule our day? You see here throughout the platform, students have the opportunity to see their schedule. Everything is scheduled for them. This is the elementary platform. There's the secondary platform. They're able to keep up. It's very organized. It's very structured. They are um, they're able to make sure they know how what they're going to do as well as work on their own and what time they'll have for that. So why Alabama parents are choosing and have chosen um, online school, full-time online school here in Alabama. You know, I think these are some five points, but I think number one, you see the concern about the environment of the previous school. We have a very unique uh, population, kids that are anxious, kids may have been bullied, Kids just need, um, you know, they, they've had a hard time, especially after COVID going back. So you see that. So we are able to provide that structure where they're able to get all of their experience, but at the same time be in their home. I think another thing is the learning coach wants to be more involved in the student's education and they get that with that one-on-one -on -one experience. The last two slides would be some data that the Stride Company, which is a national company, they actually conducted a nationwide survey. And I think you'll see here, these are some of the top 10 important reasons for deciding to enroll their student in full-time online public education. Um, this survey, some of these reasons, it's a viable choice for parents. And I think you'll see here communication, as I mentioned, safety. That's one of the recurring themes. And the next most important factors you see there, peers, more time for extracurriculars. We have a lot of students who are gymnast, equestrian, I have a hockey player that travels. I mean, we've got a lot of um, students like that that need that flexibility, that where they can participate in those passions that they have and the drive that they have to, you know, something they're wanting to pursue, either be a scholarship or their athletes or things like that. They pray for um, private and they need to get there by two on a weekend and things like that, but yet get all of their schoolwork done. So that's something that's very important. And that's, uh, I think that's important to note here too. So on behalf of Dr. Keisha Tol Tolbin, Tolbert, excuse me, who is the executive director for ALDCA and could not be here today, and myself, as well as the Stride team, we want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share about the educational experience and um, for the, our Alabama students. The people with me I'd like to recognize, we have um, Gary Bay, who is the National Coalition for Public School Options. He is here with us today. We have an Alabama chapter. We have a parent from ALDCA, Tamar Selmy Young, who lives here in Montgomery. And we also have Ashley Allen, who is the Stride Executive Director of Govern Governmental Affairs, as well as our team here that supports our um, Stride company. So are there any questions? Thank you. I have just two questions for us, committee. One, about 6,000 students in the state, is that right, that are, are under this in, in In our under stride, yes. Okay. And are the teachers employees of the state or they're not? Okay, tell me about that. Yeah, no, so they are actually, and I'm a I'm a 25-year veteran educator in Alabama, um, so they are employed by stride and they do not participate. They're not employed under RSA or as the, under the Board of Education for either school district. Okay. Comments, questions? Uh, Representative Collins? Thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm supportive of what you do. I've met several of the students that have come by over the years and okay. met with me in my office. And you're right. The reasons for participating Run the gamut. So um, that's great. I did have a question, though. Sure. Um, you mentioned your um, graduation rate being really high, and we're really trying to close the gap between the the graduation rate and then that college and career ready yeah. indicator. Do you happen to know that for your students, where they are, or what percentage graduate with one of those indicators of college 
Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I started in June and um, Alba's was not very good. It was actually an F on the report card. And, you know, that's obviously already set. You know, that that's one of the uh, requirements that's previous year. Mm -hmm. So that is why we have really um, honed in on making sure the pathways are there for our students to have those opportunities. Keisha's is higher at ALDCA, obviously, with the pathways and where they opened. Um, I think she had a C. Okay. in that percentage, but we are working to make sure that those pathways are there and those opportunities are there. Um, I'll tell you, one of the challenges is the certified teachers for career tech. It, that can be a challenge sometimes, finding those people that have the uh, certification. That makes to, sense. Yeah. To do that. So, you know, one thing we we have partnerships. We our students are able to partner and go out in the workforce. They're able to participate in the dual enrollment. So we feel like we're on the right track to correct that make that score a little better. And I better. think all the schools, public schools, are, are on that same track to That's improve right. and close that gap. But That's thank right. you for sharing what y'all are doing. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you much. so Appreciate much. It. All right, so members, the last presentation we have is uh, something I wanted to go over with the committee. Um, I, I may just sit here and go through it unless, but somebody's got to operate the slides for me. Do I need to come back there and do that? You Can you operate them for me? Okay, he's got it. Okay. I, I did do uh, some of this um, presentation, a, a, a larger presentation to the freshmen during their orientation, so some of them have seen this, but if they're like me, maybe singing again would be reinforcing. And I wanted the, the members to see this. This is a subset of a presentation I did that basically talked about the budget and also the tax situation in the state. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so I'm kind of a visual person. Yeah, what am I, my concept, my thought here was if, the, if our budget system were a solar system, this is what we would look like, okay? This is what we would look like. The Education Trust Fund, this is revenues, would be the largest planet, $10.4 billion. You can see way over there to the left, the general fund of $2.8 billion. You see under the Education Trust Fund, there's two sort of satellite planets. Uh, the Budget Stabilization Fund, which is $559 million in there right now, and the Advancement Technology Fund, which has 750 million. So I'm going to talk about the, the relationships there in a minute. You see the road fund sitting up there by itself, $1.6 billion. You see the ATF, the Alabama Trust Fund, $3.4 billion. There's two craters on that trust fund. One is the ETF rainy day account. The other is the general fund rainy day account. You can see the balances there. And then you see over there under the, uh, the purple clan at the Smaller one is a is a reserve fund for this general fund. Now a lot of people believe that we've got plenty of money down here, and we have a lot of money right now. We're sitting on it. They believe we can put this money wherever we want to put it, but we can't. Just like you can't go from Earth to Mars, you can't go from the ETF to the general fund. You can go from the uh, rainy day fund in the so so that so that uh, budget stabilization fund that's underneath the education trust fund. You can go from that planet to the education trust fund, but in six years, you got to go back. And um, the same in the general fund reserve. You can go from the reserve in the general fund to the general fund, but you got to go back up. That's not right. I, I, thought, I said that wrong. I'm getting ahead of myself. The budget stabilization fund, you can only go to the ETF if the governor declares proration. So you can only leave the budget stabilization planet and go to the ETF if the governor declares proration. Um, you can only you can go from the rainy day account in that trust fund to the education trust fund, but you have to go back in six years. If you're in the rainy day account for the general fund on that ATF planet, you can go to the general fund, but you have to go back in ten years. Uh, the road fund you can't go anywhere but to roads, and nobody can go to you except from gasoline taxes. Um, and then you look at that A&T fund, I'll explain how that works. But the point to this deal is that this is the way our budget system works. To move, to, to go from planet to planet, you've got to really do constitutional amendments or do some things that are kind of not easy to do. Go to the next slide. But if you really look at all the appropriate, what, what I showed you was just what the legislature appropriates. If you look at all the, the appropriations that go to these funds, you can see the general fund and the education trust fund are not that much different in size because the general fund gets $13 billion of federal and local direct earmarks. And so that earmarking that, that we have, which is also constitutional, about half of those in the education trust fund are statutory, half are constitutional. But the point is, 
that those earmarks, when you add all the funding in, you get like this 30, now probably $40 billion enterprise, although we only appropriate here in the education budget last year, $8.3 billion. So a lot of money is going directly into these funds that uh, we have no control over. Go to the next slide. This just shows the growth in the, in the ATF appropriations uh, from, from uh, 2013 to 2023, 8.3 billion last year. So you can see our growth has been not uh, hockey stick type, but just steadily growth. Look at the next slide and look at where does the education trust fund money come from? A lot of people today are going around saying that we should eliminate income taxes in the state. And if we do, there goes 65% of the education trust fund. So that's part of it. You can see that 27% of the education trust fund money comes from sales taxes. So as we think about sales tax reductions and all these things, you have to consider that. You'll notice there underneath the sales tax, the, the green, there's a little very tiny sliver for the simplified seller's use tax. So, you know, this is the SSU tax that's paid on internet sales. 75% of that money goes into the general fund. 25% comes to the education trust fund, but it's a very small part of what we collect in terms of everything else. Um, go to the next slide and you see the general fund receipts. They come from a lot of different places. Uh, the, the orange down there in the bottom is insurance company taxes. About 20% of their revenues from insurance company taxes. You can see that about 8.3% of their taxes, that top yellow to the left, that's the simplified seller's use tax. So there's their 75% of, of the use tax is about 8% of their budget. Cor correct me if I misspeak on anything, okay? Um, uh, the use taxes are about 11%. You can see out the ABC board uh, is in the blue there to the right, about 6%. You know, it was interesting that during COVID, um, we saw a lot of increases in the revenue general fund from the alcohol, and that was just that was just a fact. Um, so you can see down there too that cigarette tax is 4%, corporation taxes, uh, ad valorem tax is 7%. So the general fund has a lot of different things that, they, that it comes to. And again, they go there, they can't come to the education trust fund. Next slide. The Alabama trust fund. Now this is the fund that has two craters on it, the education trust fund rainy day account and the general fund rainy day account. We can only access those during proration. And we can, and if you, if we borrow from them, you have to go back. So yesterday the house passed a payment to pay off the rainy day balance um, in the ATF and that hopefully the Senate will pass that as well. So that's a borrowing account. So if you go to the next page, what's in that trust fund? It's about $3 billion, $3.4 billion right now. It's basically the perpetual trust established in 1985, which is the oil and gas capital payments received from the offshore oil and gas leases. And there's a plan under the Constitution Amendment that was passed that says 33% of the earnings every year and 5% of the assets go into the general fund. So that little general fund receipts on that previous chart had some contribution from the ATF. That's all that can go. The rest of that has to sit there and just grow as the oil and gas leases are collected. And eventually to use that money, we would need basically a constitutional amendment to use that. I've already mentioned the rainy day accounts that are that are within that fund. We can access that during times of proration, but they're limited. For example, uh, funds may be assessed only to avoid proration. Withdrawals are limited to 10% of the prior year appropriation for the general fund and 6.5% of the prior year appropriation for the education trust fund. So there's limitations there, but again, that money has to be paid back. Six years the education from the education fund and 10 years. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, just one quick question. This is in regards to the uh, oil and gas capital payments. Uh, this, this is something from the offshore oil and gas leases. Um, the, these payments, I understand, these these are diminishing. That's my understanding. They are the. Yeah, the right, is a, right. A I, I just want yeah. to make yeah. certain, sure that that was understood. That the, these are are monies that are diminishing. That we're not receiving as much as we used to. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Representative Drummond, like to know the reason why. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next slide, the Education Trust Fund. Last year we had an $8.3 billion budget, and again, we have the budget stabilization and the A&T, the Advancement Technology Fund. 
So here's what, we go to the next slide, let's, let's see how this works. So in years where the ETF appropriations are equal to the fiscal year cap. Now you remember there's a calculation that we do that basically says every year how much we can spend. Uh, last year we could spend nine billion dollars. The prior year budget was 7.7 .7 billion. We chose not to go from 7.7 .7 to nine billion. We went to 8.3, so we didn't spend to the cap. There's a calculation of the cap. It's a complicated calculation. We're actually looking to see if we can maybe um, modify that because you basically take a 15 year period and you throw out the low year, maybe we should throw out the high year with COVID. It's kind of the COVID situation has distorted our calculation. So we're evaluating that. But let's just take the scenario where you spend, you appropriate to the cap. If you get money that actually comes in that's over what you appropriated. So if we appropriate $8.3 billion and we receive $10 billion, then, a, then the first there's a waterfall. The first thing that happens is money goes into the budget stabilization fund. This was the fund that was designed to avoid proration. And up to 1% of the previous year's appropriation can be allocated to that amount until it reaches a balance of 7.5% of the previous year's appropriation. So there's a limit to what that can be. Um, but um, the budget stabilization fund can only be again withdrawn if the governor declares proration. I want to speak to proration. So what happens? We're budgeting. The budget goes into effect October one or September. You know, for the first of the year, and then what happens is your sp your school year is going. So the first six months of your school year is spending based on that budget. Well, if you've hit a recession and you're you're down twenty percent, well, January comes around. And you've got to catch up because you're going to be out of money because you're spending at a rate where the receipts have now fallen off. If you're prorated 20%, you're going to have to you're going to if you're going to if, 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 if you're going to have to, to double up to catch up because you've spent you've spent the first six months overspent. You've got to make it up the second up. That's why proration was such a terrible thing when it happened. Budget stabilization um, approach and the Rolling Reserve Act made sure that we have very limited opportunity to have experience proration. So the first so what happens is if we budget and we have more than we budget, then the first tranche of that money is going to go into this budget stabilization fund. Right now there's a five hundred fifty nine million in that account. Go to the next slide. Once that money, if there's money left over after that, then it rolls into the Advancement Technology Fund. And this fund is basically a fund that goes to K-12 uh, schools and to the higher ed and the, and the community colleges. And we basically split that money in accordance with the the split of the budget. And so right now there's $750 million. Now what has to happen is uh, that um, uh, we we uh, appropriate go to the next slide. We appropriate that though through in, through a supplemental appropriation bill. So you have the budget. If we have money left over, we will come back and do a supplemental appropriation. Say so the money left over, we're going to appropriate that. So in this A and T fund, they can use this money for repairs and deferred maintenance, classroom support, ensuring facilities, transportation, security uh, measures as part of a security plan an acquisition of additional equipment. We modified it last year so they can use this for capital as well. So um, we, we would uh, supplementally appropriate the bill the next regular session or special session of the legislature that this money is available. Does that make sense? So you got, if you have excess money, budget stabilization fund, then it goes into the advancement technology fund. Those situations happen if you spend appropriate to the cap. What happens if you don't spend to the cap. That's where we are today. We're sitting on a lot of money. And so we would then have to determine what do we do with that money? And that's what we're about to go into regular session and probably fight about is how do, how do we spend that extra money? Um, but the point is that would have to be done through supplemental appropriations or some other legislation. Uh, the next thing I want to just briefly touch on is the road fund. You see $1.6 billion. Basically, the road fund is coming primarily from gasoline taxes. And, uh, you know, for 27 years, we had not changed the gasoline tax. So as cost went up to build the roads and as cars, cars became more fuel efficient, um, our model just didn't work. So we passed the gas tax several years ago, which was a rebuild Alabama act. And it basically, over a period of time, phased in a 10 cent 
uh, tax. And so you got the road and bridge fund from the initial source, then this Rebuild Alabama fund, and the Rebuild Alabama proceeds are split 66%, 67% to ALDOT for the Rebuild Alabama, 25% to the counties, 8.3% to municipalities. But the point there is that we can only um, use gasoline taxes for that road fund. That's how we build roads. The next question that I have is what happens if and when, or when and if, the uh, we convert to electric vehicles, which um, some people say sooner than later that the the uh, auto industry is investing two hundred sixty billion dollars in electric vehicle conversion. There's a lot of these are federal mandates and things that you know we can discuss the merits of that. But the question is, if the market takes us to electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, how are we going to build roads? We do it right now with gasoline taxes. So that's an issue we got to deal with long term. Um, so that's just a general thing I want you to take away from this, that we are, uh, you know, money, we have a high percentage of our funds are earmarked to education trust fund. That's what we deal with. We can't just move the money from one place to the other without a constitutional amendment uh, to do those things. And that's difficult to do. As, as a CA, of course, requires a very high threshold of both the House and the Senate that has to go on the ballot and has to be voted on by the people. And it's a long proposition. And um, not certainly something you can you can rely on because you you can't predict what would happen. It's a quick overview. Any questions or comments or clarifications, Kirk? Did I misspeak? Uh, Representative Collins. I don't remember right now exactly, but I was thinking in the gasoline tax change that we did include some part for electric vehicles. There is a there is a fee. I don't remember. But it would not replace the loss of it would gas. Not no, it would not, it's not a dollar for true. dollar. No. I didn't remember how much. No. It was. Yes, sir. Representative uh, Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a comment uh, in regards to uh, last year's uh, budget and not spending to the cap. And uh, you mentioned about the additional monies being available. Uh, I, I just making my comment. Uh, there are so many needs that we have out there that we're working at to chip away. For example, the pre-K program continue to expand that, uh, trying to provide support for the Literacy Act, also for the Numeracy Act, uh, just technology, uh, mental health, just so many different needs out there. So I guess I'm making a point in that we may think that we're sort of flush with money and that all our needs are being met, but uh, we still have a long ways to go to address and, and support a lot of these educational needs. Right. Thank you. And Alabama is not alone in having a surplus. Most all states have surpluses right now because the receipts during COVID because of the federal influx of money and in Alabama is about $60 billion, of course, fed fueled income tax and sales taxes in the state. So all states have a, a surplus. Ours is, is, is significant, $2.8 billion in education trust fund, but Moody did an analysis where they looked at what would happen in, if, in an economic recession, how states would fare based upon their rainy day accounts, their reserves, and their surplus. And Alabama would be number 20 in terms of how we would fare. So in the bell curve, we're in the bell, which basically is kind of a sweet spot. There are states that have a lot higher reserves than we have. There are states near us, nearby us, and other places that have a lot lower reserves. In a recession, they would be underwater. In recession, we would actually come out kind of right us in the bell, the bell curve. So our part of our reason we have the reserve, though, is because for two years, we did not spend to the cap. People want to say that we just spend, 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 but we actually did not spend what we were allowed to spend in under the principle of being fiscally conservative. And so when you don't spend, you've you've kind of set that aside. Now, the question is, what do we do with it? And that's what we're going to have discussion. I mentioned earlier, I hope the when I said we're going to fight about it, that was a, a, a humorous way of saying we're going to have a lot of discussion about because a lot of ideas about where to put that money. And um, we'll have those discussions. But um, anyway, we're not alone in having a surplus, and that's not indicating that we've over that we've that we we're, we're we're we have over collected or over taxing. It's just, we're in a weird situation right now. Uh, Representative Stubbs, Mr. Chairman, I'd appreciate the opportunity. I'd just like to make a brief comment regarding some of the surplus and the fact that in the last several years um, there has been an effort to not spend to the cap. I think we also need to be mindful of some appropriations that were made in previous years, some including the capital improvements projects and the uh, bond issue that was made where some of those appropriations 
actually resulted in shortfalls because of inflation and other things where there are projects that were identified and projects that were um, expected to come under a certain budget that is not feasible anymore. And so we may find that there are opportunities to uh, shore up some of those projects that were planned or ongoing with the intent of also doing what um, was mentioned earlier with regards to all the other areas we need to focus on. Thank you. Good comments. Anybody else want to lobby for a position? We've had two. two, two. <laughs> Anyone else? Representative Drummond? Comment? I've got a lot, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always want to ask. Uh, Representative Colvin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just still confused what fishing means. <laughs> <laughs> what a good point. You ought to be an educator. That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We will uh, meet again next week. Hopefully, we'll be uh, hopefully we'll be in regular session. We'll be looking beginning our process now of taking up some legislation. Uh, again, I would want to encourage you to go by and speak with RSA and request a meeting with them if you have any questions about that. Come see me if you have any issues uh, or questions. Representative Keeley, you have anything you want to say for the good of okay? And uh, other with with that, uh, we're adjourned. Mm -hmm.